Welcome to a presentation of Networks for Training and Development's 20th Employment Support Symposium. Funding for the symposium has been provided by the City of Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. We hope you enjoy the session. Hi everyone and welcome to part two of How Far Can a Needle Carry You? Quilt Making for Social Change. My name is Jessica Stover with Networks for Training and Development. The session is funded in part by Northumberland County Department of Behavioral Health, Intellectual and Developmental Services, and Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And we thank them so much for their ongoing support. So without further ado, uh, I'd be happy to turn this over to Tishka Smith, the curator of today's session. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome everybody. So grateful to be here again today on this dreary Friday afternoon in Philadelphia. Um, I wanna thank you all for spending time with us this afternoon. And as you all continue to stream in, if you can uh, just drop a quick message in the chat, letting us know where you're from. We, you know, it's nice to see um, all parts of the nation and the world represented today to celebrate these wonderful, phenomenal women these wonderful artists today. Um, we're gonna drop a link in the chat also to the replay of um, part one that took place in December. It's now on YouTube. You can check that out if you have it. And if you can, um, go ahead and press one in the chat if you were here um, in person, spending time with us uh, for the for the live stream in December. Just drop a one in the chat. We want to see um, who's familiar with uh, kind of the backstory, um, so we can figure out how to get started here. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Get the presentation here up for everybody. Um, in the meantime, while this is loading, um, you know, we're, we're back here to continue this conversation. It was so positive, so animated, so insightful. We ran out of time. <laughs> so um, we're back to kind of pick up where we left off. And um, due to a lot of good feedback from the chat last time, we want to kind of get a sense of how um, Beth and Dinga and Betty are all connected. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about um, the backstory again. I just want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for this live stream. Um, as I was doing my research, I came across um, the late Hurtison Rankin, who um, was from Norman, Mississippi. And in 1997, she received a National Heritage Fellowship from the NEA. At that time, she was among 11 musicians and artists, and she was named a National, uh, National Endowment of the Arts Heritage Fellow, which is the uh, NEA's most prestigious honor in folk and traditional crafts. And um, so she traveled to Washington, D.C. with her daughter, and she met with Hillary Clinton, who at the time was First Lady. And um, so she was quoted as saying, um, the following, I never knew a quilt could go so far in life. Just thinking about it, how far can a needle carry you? So today we're going to, you know, we're going to spend some time obviously talking with these brilliant artists about their process, about their inspiration. But before we jump into that, I'm going to try to share my screen again. I want to hear from them about how they're connected. But before I jump into that, I wanna read their bios real quick. Um, so first up is Betty Leecraft, who is a textile and me mixed media fiber artist, visual artist, educator, and curator residing here in Philadelphia. She blends multiple techniques and processes to create works that blur the lines and boundaries between art quilts, wearable art, sculpture, and installation. Her work is informed by artistic and cultural traditions of Africa and the Africa diaspora, addressing themes of identity, heritage, 
symbolism, environment, and ritual. Ms. Lee Craft has received many grants, awards, honors, and has exhibited nationally and internationally. Her quilts are, have been published in books by Dr. Carolyn L. Maslumi, who is a renowned scholar and historian and founder of the Women of Color Quilters Network. As an educator, Betty uh, created opportunities for underserved, under-resourced communities and individuals through interactive, hands-on textile arts projects. So if you can give a virtual round of applause for Betty, um, and I'm gonna move on to Dinga McCannon, who is an award-winning fine artist, muralist, teacher, author, and illustrator who currently resides in Philadelphia also. She is a native of Harlem, New York, and her body of work is a celebration of women's lives and a window into the history and lived experience of women and African-American women in particular. Her works frequently incorporate and juxtapose multiple styles and methods that poetically and generously reframe the cano canonical aesthetics of history and representation bringing to the fore late narratives, experiences, and appearances. By opening up the past and present at sites of competing perspectives and possibilities, McCannon extends us an invitation to reimagine the future. Among other milestones, her work has been featured in several exhibitions at key galleries and museums, including the Brooklyn Museum of Art and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. And her work is uh, in the permanent collections of the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Brooklyn Museum of Art and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. She is a founding member of the Wayo Artist Collective and the Where We At Artist Collective. So let's give her a virtual round of applause as well. Uh, last but not least, Dr. Beth Mao has worked for 45 years with organizations and individuals spanning the globe towards the ideal that every person with a disability can be a valued member of community life. Based in New York City, she runs a consulting firm, Graphic Futures, where she creates and implements innovation proje projects that transform options for people through personal, organizational, and policy change. Her groundbreaking work, personal futures planning, promotes the positive futures and images of people with disabilities throughout the globe and demonstrates that all of us count and all of us fit somewhere. In addition to her social activism, Mal creates art that complements and defines her unique style of cross-cultural and multi-literate communication. She supports people to create person-centered plans via art, and she creates quilts that help people communicate the spirit and beauty of personal, organizational, and social change. Throughout her publications and her art, Mount weaves together stories, symbols, and patterns of the longings, joys, struggles, and beauty of people who are learning together and creating a more beloved community. Let's give a virtual round of applause to Beth Mao. All right, so since some of you were here before and some of you are new, um, I've dispensed with the introductions and the reintroductions. Let's spend a little time in dialogue. So I wanna ask an opening question um, here about how you all came to know each other. You know, when I talk to each of you individually, um, you all shared a lot of insights and, and stories about how you came to know each other, but I want you to share those with the audience. And I want to start with um, Betty, Betty Lee Craft. Yep, first. I want you to talk to me and talk to the audience about how you came to know Dinga McCannon. Well, first of all, thank you. And um, thanks to all who have tuned in. The first time I remember Dinga McCann's name was when I joined uh, a group of black artists that were national called National Conference of Artists. And that was somewhere in the 80s. And uh, that's the first time I really 
heard her name, I began to see her work later on. Um, we've kind of journeyed along, especially through the Women of Color Quilters Network, because there was a gap of, gap of time that we didn't see each other. And then when we reconnected, it was through the Women of Color Quilters Network and the traveling exhibitions that go along um, with that. And now that she has moved to Philadelphia, I've taken a couple of workshops at her house. And so, you know, it, it's easier for us to connect. But as I said before, when we first met each other, I know my hair was still dark and now it is not. So that's the span of time because I'm not mentioning years, but I guess I already did with the period of time that I first uh, encountered her. And uh, the thing about Dinga that's really special is that she's proficient in so many mediums. And that was the thing that I was always amazed with, uh, with regard to her. And Beth, I met as a result of being asked to be in this Zoom, the first one and this one. So I'm glad to meet Beth and to find out that she had come to a show that Dinga and I had both been in, in 1990 something, the first um, Women of Color Quilters exhibition at the, at that time it was called uh, the Craft Museum. It's now Museum of Art and Design. So I guess that's it in a nutshell, so others can chime in. So yeah, I wanna jump, thank you for sharing that by the way. Um, and you you beat me to the punch of, of I was gonna ask you how you came to know Beth, uh, but I wanna jump in here before we move on to Dinga. Um, I found about, about Dinga through Beth and found out that you two had a long-standing relationship. So I want to hear from you, Beth, on, or actually Dinga, about how you came to know Beth and how that, how that relationship has evolved over time. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, first. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I first remember meeting Beth, and it was either the late 80s or like 1991. At probably one of the worst shows I ever did in my life, which happened to be at the Museum of Natural History. They would have a craft show twice a year. Um, every once in a while, we would connect. And then at some point, I found out that Beth was working with the same population that I was working in. Because uh, as an artist, I really never had a permanent job. I was a freelance art teacher and I ended up working mostly um, with mentally challenged people in prisons, uh, in homeless shelters, and Beth and I shared our love of passing the tradition of art on to the forgotten people, as I called them, and the beloved people, as she called them. Uh, I think, oh, then I ran into you at the... Um, the Harlem Fine Art Show that year. That was the next, oh, and before that, I remember Beth very kindly would send me fabric for my students because in the programs I worked in, of course, the money was always short. I, I spent a lot of money out of my own pocket and Beth sent me a huge box of absolutely phenomenal fabrics. So my students had wonderful materials to work with and I still thank you, Beth. Um, then we ran into each other at the Harlem Fine Art Show, where Beth was instrumental in getting one of my quilts sold, which was wonderful because that was not a financial success for me, that particular show. And over the years, we've, I've worked, I've um, done projects with her, and we've just remained connected. And it's been a wonderful relationship. So we probably 30, 40 years, something like that. I love that, the threads of connection. This is what this is all about. Um, thank you for sharing that, Dinka. Um, like I came to know you through Beth and Beth and I showed um, many years ago, back in 2013, um, in, a, in a group exhibit sponsored by Networks for Training and Development. That's how I came to know Beth. I knew Betty from um, watching her from the cloud 
<laughs> and then eventually being able to show with her um, through a massive project called Philadelphia Assembled um, back in 2017. So um, that's how I got to know her work. Um, so Beth, can you talk about how Dinga and um, Betty influenced you um, a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, and in fact, it's such an honor and a, and a privilege to be in this dialogue together because I so consider Dinga and all the whole body of African American story quilters have been my inspiration from the day I met Dinga. And I have to say that um, uh, Dinga's right. She was out on the sidewalk in front of the Museum of Natural History. I was heading into the subway and her table is right next to that subway entrance. And here she is, she's selling and Dinga, I have this post, this card I bought from you that day for $5. And I have a placemat of the same image that I bought for $10. I'm just telling you that because Dinga had some of the her original quilts, which were thousands of dollars. And then she had reproductions of them. And I, and, and it was just, she was so distinctive because the person next to her was selling like, you know, had 5,000 coffee cups that they were selling. And here's Dinga kind of a sort of a, a, a holding court. She had such a sense of royalty and presence uh, at this table with these astounding original quilts. And I had never seen anything like that before. And it just, uh, it just there, you know how you have these moments in life where you meet someone or something happens and it just changes everything inside of you and in your imagination. And I was already working at the time with young people in transition from New York City high schools. And in New York City, these young people and their families, they speak 800 languages, right? And half of all New Yorkers don't speak English at home. It's that multicultural. And already I was struggling to find a way to support people to engage across difference. And there was something about seeing these story quilts and understanding uh, that this is a way to tell stories and to, uh, and to also show up. I think it's really important to, to say that it was so clear that um, Dinka and her work represented in all the, in so many women in the African uh, American story quilting a community is that the work itself is a way to stand up in the face of a culture and an art world that pretty much renders you invisible, right? And yet here's Dinga, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here, even if you almost put me in the subway. <laughs> and, you know, I'm showing up. And somehow in that moment, I just knew that what she did and what I was longing for it was like a missing piece in my entire um, in my entire way of thinking about how to share stories and to know reality really and so I consider Dinga to be one of my uh, most important mentors um, I have learned so much from her she's so generous as are so many of the women in this particularly this women of color network and that there's such a sense of of engagement in the role of art as a revolutionary tool and as a and as a way to support people in their own resistance to being rendered invisible. And there are so many other ways that I've been inspired over, over time. And then Betty's right, the first show that I went to 1998, the Spirits of the Cloth exhibit at the American Craft Museum, that was the first time I saw this whole community body of work. And Betty had a piece in that exhibit and in the book. And uh, Carolyn Mazzalomi's work is so important because she made visible this entire collection of work. Um, and, uh, and I have basically been a groupie ever since. So that's my story. Thank you so much, Beth. 
Um, so we've asked the chat, we've asked the audience to continue um, this conversation about the threads of connection and they're sharing how they came to know you all and your work. So get a chance, you know, um, if you're not speaking, just, you know, checking on the chat and see all the love that's being shared. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the more, uh, I like to call it clinical aspects of this conversation. we got some questions for you. Um, and Beth, we're going to start with you. Um, the first question, um, if you can describe how your body of work, your artistic practice, and your process, or any combination of the three, debunks some of the prevailing myths of quilt making. And I'm gonna to advance to the next slide and um, pull up your quilt entitled um, Waymarks to Hope. And what I did, I, you know, I like, to, I like to start with the definitions of words. So I know I'm on the same you know, playing field as, as the person who titles a work. Um, and Beth, a waymark is an object serving as a guide for someone traveling. And so what are the way marks in this quilt? And if you could describe the process that led to their inclusion and, and maybe talk to us a little bit about how they um, serve as a pathway towards hope. Oh, okay. Love the way you put ideas and words together so much. Um, so this piece was a commission by the ARC of Westchester when they were moving into a new space, having deconstructed the traditional sheltered workshop, which was the place that 400 people with intellectual disabilities had basically been gathered together for a number of years in this old segregated setting. And this particular agency had made an effort to support people to move out of that segregated place and into real jobs and real lives in the community. And so moving into this new building was part of letting go of this old way of thinking about people and stepping into a new narrative, a new story about who people were and what, what, the, um, what the purpose of the work of the organization was becoming. And so the self-advocates, which was a group of people with intellectual disabilities who were supported by the agency, had asked that water be a part of what was expressed in the new building, in the new space. And yet the director of the agency didn't quite understand why that was important to people. And so he had been exposed to this story quilting and invited me in to listen to people and create an occasion where we might listen deeper to people's thinking about what it was that they wanted the world to know about who they are and, um, and why this image of water was so important. And so it became really evident right away that they felt like when they were supported well by the organization, they brought hope and renewal to their communities by the ways they showed up and made a difference. And so you, why don't you advance to the next slide um, so that you can have a sense of who was involved initially in making art and describing why this image of water was important to them and what they wanted the world to understand and know about who they were when they were at their best. And so the, um, and you can go to the next slide now. This was the early, this was an early effort where we used paper to start getting people's ideas and images and lived experience together. And these are 12 of the people who became the spokespersons for the story behind the piece, behind the quilt. And so what they wanted people to understand is when the, the quilt became like a covenant with the organization is when the organization does its work well, then they live their best lives and 
it is a source of renewal and uh, hope and um, a kind of uprising of possibility in the community. And so the quilt was a composite of their different designs and the 12 of them became spokespeople for a different way of thinking about who people with disabilities are in the community. And they were the designated storytellers. So one of the things about um, most of the work that, that I've been a part of constructing with people is that it supports people to tell their story. And the, um, the most significant shift that happened as a result of their work and being seen as artists and philosophers, really their narratives about this work were profoundly uh, deep and evocative and um, compelling. And they made a film together where their voices came to light. And shortly after this was finished, the organization deconstructed its board of directors, which was the group that sent down um, direction for the agency into 24 different circles, uh, design circles. And each of these self-advocates was a member and a voice um, inside of those circles. So they went from being clients in this organization to being not only um, uh, active citizens in their communities, but also really active participants in the governance of the organization and direction setting. Um, so Waymarks is a way to say, how are you doing at meeting the mark that you've agreed to uh, in supporting us to live our best lives? Thank you so much. And I have in my notes, this, this, the group won awards for this? For this yes, yeah. uh, actually a national award um, for self-advocacy leadership. Uh, the organization and the group was recognized nationally as a group of people bringing their voice and bringing their wisdom to light in ways that had never been seen before. Very powerful story. Thank you for sharing that. And this quilt is so beautiful. I mean, as I was studying it and just trying to put together like an image description, it just, this is so much, you know, so much beauty and so much symbolism. Um, and you're right, the, the, the aspect of water being um, a prominent element in it, you know, you can, you can see that um, as well. Um, thank you for sharing that. So we're gonna move to our next artist. Um, I'm going to advance the slide here. So you're up, Betty. Oops. Betty. Yes. Let's talk to us about the, the image of the quilt that's on screen right now, Matrilineal Praise Song. Um, just a little bit about, you know, just speaking to the question of how, how your work, this particular work debunks myths prevailing myths about, about quilt making? Well, first of all, this piece um, was made specifically for a show that happened at Swarthmore College in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania um, through the, the List Gallery and the library that was there because um, it was really something that I had to debate whether I wanted to be in this exhibition because it was called Responses to G's Bend. Mm -hmm. Because the main exhibition in the gallery was the work of, uh, I would say the star of G's Bend, Mary Lee Bendoff and her daughter. So uh, 19, 18 or 19 artists were juried into this show, Responses to G's Bend. And I had been a great admirer of their work, but I didn't feel like I needed to regurgitate their particular style to make my point. So um, one of the things that influenced my work, even though she's no longer here, is my maternal grandmother, uh, Sadie A. Wills, whose image you do see there in the quilt. And that image was actually um, helped to come into um, that quilt by way of Denga, 
because I had her copy it on her machine for me. So thank you, Dinga. Uh, this quilt speaks to ancestors because it's about the third or the fourth piece in the matrilineal praise song series and it's called Night Clothes. And before I get into debunking myths and things like that, I will just say that this piece consists of deconstructed pajama top of my deceased mother, a prayer written in my grandmother's own hand that I found on a piece of paper and had a friend of mine, Elizabeth McElvain, uh, silk screen it on one of my grandmother's nightgowns that I kept from the time I was her caregiver. So it's a very personal piece. And the colors that are there were favorites of my mother's and my grandmother's. So I do a lot of things in terms of color symbolism to take the place of obvious um, imagery because I don't really do a lot of realistic work because it's not my forte or my best skill. So I find other ways uh, in which to express myself including hand painting, hand dyeing, which some of the pieces of the um, quilt were from previous matrilineal praise song pieces that had been hand dyed, hand painted, and I included them in a continuum, so to speak. And because this prayer is here, it's one of the first ones I committed to memory by way of my grandmother, who for a lot of African-Americans in my age group that was your spiritual guide in family. And I still say this prayer every day. So anything that I make that has uh, an ancestor slant is a nod and a thank you to those women who did this work before me upon whose shoulders I really stand. So when I get the chance to do that, I definitely do that. Now, as far as debunking myths, I'm not sure where to start because my expression goes in more than one direction. So there, at one time there were three pieces in a show and one person told me this looks like three different people did the work. And I was glad to hear that because I am not wanting to be pigeonholed. And so a lot of my work uh, will reflect that in some way, maybe in content, maybe in concept, or maybe in just the use of color symbolism. And also um, the fact that I don't feel the need to follow the Western canon of how you should create art, that everything that is in a, in a series doesn't necessarily have to reflect the same colors. It can just be about the theme because this work looks a little different from the others that are part of the same ancestor series. Uh, the other thing is just the fact that, you know, I'm an African-American woman raised in America, but of African descent. And that in and of itself gives me something that's going to separate me from uh, quilters from other ethnic groups who may come with their own lived experiences in the work. Because I feel very strongly that African-American quilts should not be pigeonholed into one style or another because we do various works. And as the late uh, great historian, Cuesta Benberry, who by the way was the reason why I met Carolyn Manslumi, said in a lecture of hers, I am a freedom fighter for African-American quilt makers, whatever their expression." Because for a while there was, you know, the, the idea that African-American women's quilts looked one particular way, which is not the truth. Because if you go to a Carolyn Mass Lumi show, you see that front and center. So um, my work is really about uh, sometimes going against the norm by using things that are unexpected. This quilt, leaves a warm feeling. With yes, it. I agree. But there's another one, the one that you saw last time, that leaves people thinking a lot. And like I said, it, that one, uh, the camouflage piece, is not the kind that you get to match your home decor mm -hmm. because its content alone 
could eat the sofa. So um, I, I am just concerned about going my own way and not listening to what other people are doing in terms of trends, but following my own voice. And that's what makes you memorable, Betty. <laughs> Thank you. So what I, before we move on to Dinga, who um, has a quilt that she selected to address the question of debunking myths, I want to advance the slide to um, show everyone. I dug up uh, um, a description of the um, responses to G's Ben group exhibit that she talked about that the quilt was juried into um, at Swarthmore. So just you know, so people can get a quick peek of, um, you know, who was involved, um, who was featured, et cetera. And there were a number of events that were uh, staged in conjunction with the show. So I just want to make sure, you know, just putting it into context, you know, sharing this material. Um, so thank you, Betty. Um, so I'm going to advance the slide here. And um, so Dinga, you're up. Um, on screen, I embraced a young, I need to move this, <laughs> embrace the younger woman. I used to be, but I love the old lady in parentheses, wink, wink, I've become. So if you could, Dinga, talk to us about how this particular work debunks prevailing quilt making myths. First of all, a lot of times when you tell people you quilt, the first thing they think about, oh, can you make something for my bed? And in my whole career, maybe I've made five or six quilts for beds and mostly for family, and all, actually all of them were for family members so that they would have something of mine that they could see every day. Um, this is a quilt, but it's more than a quilt because the top half and the bottom half, those are quilted pieces. In between is a paper sculpture. And um, also it debunks myths because people think of quilts uh, primarily as decorative. This one makes a statement. This piece is about aging. Um, throughout my life, you know, we've always had to fight against the different isms. And then when you hit 60, 65, suddenly you hit with a whole nother bunch of isms and a whole nother bunch of prejudices and a whole uh, other bunch of things that people think because you're older, you're supposed to be. So um, this piece is sort of like a combination of quilt art and also fine art because the body here is made from paper that's been molded over one of those um, display dress forms. And then on the side also is two pages out of a book that I did because I had a, a career and not a lot of people have seen this of making art books. And this particular art book was about, oh my God, I'm 65. So it shows some of the things that I began to realize at 65. The, Pieces that are hanging down on the bottom, those are discriminations and issues that the outer world sees uh, when you become an older person. Um, I'm sure I can't see what's on there and I can't really remember everything I wrote, but there were things about welcome to Pill America. Uh, there was a half a story of how I walked into a, a fabric store and the first thing the person said was, I hate old people. <laughs> He's no longer working at that fabric store. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and to me, the piece, uh, this shows how art really is a multifaceted tool. And there's, there's no reason why you can't uh, intermarry anybody that you feel that will help you or any uh, medium that will help you tell the story that you want to tell. And uh, yeah, that's the story of that piece and why it definitely, and I think most of my career, I've sort of, uh, like Betty, I never wanted to be pigeonholed because I'm in a state, I describe it as constant exploration, constant trying of new media, constant learning of new media. And um, 
people ask me why I do that. And it's because I don't want to bore myself and I'm fascinated with everything. And there's so much um, energy mediums out there in the world. I would like to try to do most of them that I'm attracted to. So therefore there's no holes bar. When I decide to create something, I have like a whole world of medium and possibilities. And I love that. I like what you said about um, combining quilt art and fine art. And I see it as literally like blurring the boundaries between the two and, and creating a whole new way of thinking about how you know all these media work together to tell a story. Um, and I also like the idea of constantly being in experiment mode. Like you're like a you're like a scientist, like figuring out ways to put things together to tell these amazing stories. And I actually came across that that anecdote that you shared about the man in the fabric store. I was cracking up. Like you said, of course we didn't get along after that. And then there was a list following about strips. Um, on this piece. And um, one of them was silver is not a curse word to me because it's a whole other thing about hair. Everyone dyes their hair and it's quite evident that you are old. I don't think there's, uh, and you continue, and you said something to the effect of let your son fill out their form online. Uh, it was just hilarious reading, <laughs> reading um, sort of the context behind this piece. Um, I have one question for you. Mm -hmm. Was this part, is this part of the Harlem Memory series that you created or is this separate from that? Or is this no, all this is separate than that. The Harlem Memory series is a result of me carrying or keeping the bag of letters yeah. and yeah. other memorabilia that I inherited uh, when I became the eldest in the family when my mother passed in 2000. Okay. So, however, this went to Jamel Mansion in Harlem. It was uh, a piece of an exhibition sponsored by the Harlem Needle Arts. I forget, and please forgive me, Michelle, if you're looking, the title of the exhibition, but this is what I submitted for that. So. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pivot in a different direction with our next question and I'll put it on screen for everyone. I'll read aloud, which dimensions of your work as quilt makers, and we're, gonna, you know, we're using that term broadly, do you intentionally want viewers to not just see, but reflect upon? And then a follow-up question, how do those elements guide viewers into your vision as a just, of a just, inclusive world? And I believe, um, according to my notes, we're gonna kick this one off with Betty's quilt. I'll pull it up right now. Um, entitled Nation Time 2020, Power and Protection from Racial Terrorism. Okay, um, this is the latest quilt that I have made. And it's going to be featured in an exhibition in Minnesota that's called uh, Racism in the, well, the name of the whole exhibition is We Are the Story because there are seven exhibitions. And the one that this quilt in is in the last of the seven, which is called Racism in the Face of Hate, We Resist. And when I was told um, what this, was going to be about. The subject of lynching was something that I had wanted to approach for some time, but I found it very traumatic and very gut-wrenching and I never did it. So after George Floyd was murdered, I knew that that was the time for me to bring this thing to um, some sort of a piece that I could create. And the thing about it is it's a highly symbolic quilt and it's calling attention to lynchings that occurred after the George Floyd murder, because I found out at least six people of color were actually lynched. And it, it, it struck me in such a way that I knew that I needed to 
uh, express myself, but I wanted to do it without a piece that had bodies swinging from trees as part of the imagery. So I relied on symbolism as I usually do. And, um, you know, this visual narrative really has a signed definition to the use of color, to the use of the objects that you see there, and even the way that the letters and the hand and the fist are uh, painted. I guess what I could say with this piece, because it's sparse compared to others, were the colors, red, black, and green. Most African-Americans know that as the colors that we associate with ourselves, with national pride and being an African descended person. The eyes and the fingers were actually cutouts from African fabric that I had brought back from Ghana because I felt that the fingers at the top in the red quadrants were pointing to those who were the victims of these horrific acts of lynching. Those in the green, uh, the green quadrants at the bottom were pointing to the time and the geographic place where these things took place. That it was not during enslavement, this was now, it was right now. Um, other things in terms of symbolism, the clenched fists, of course, uh, speaking to resistance and solidarity. The other open hand is a stylized version of a protective amulet that I know as Hand of Fatima, but many other people would know it as Hamsa. But Hand of Fatima was the name that I was bringing forth. And inside uh, both these, the clenched fist and the Hand of Fatima are digitally embroidered Adinkra symbols, but not those symbols that most people are familiar with. So both of them speak to uh, unity in some way or another. And the eyes that you see in the quilt are those of the victims and those of the perpetrators who have allowed these things to happen and who have in fact uh, taken place. And I'm not sure if I've answered everything that you have asked. So if there's anything else that you need, uh, please let me know. No, I think that's a that's a pretty comprehensive response. So just to encapsulate, you're you're using color and symbolism to guide viewers into an understanding of why we need to move past racism and police brutality. Um, you call in the in the title racial terrorism. Um, but I think that if they really want more insight from you, they need to need to put on their calendar to uh, check out your exhibit, right? Well, that exhibit is at the Textile Center in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's under the banner of We Are the Story. So if you go to textilecenter.com and click on We Are the Story, you will see the entire shoot and match of all the exhibits up to this last one that I'm in, which starts on March 26th and ends in June. Of course, I'd love to go there, but I'm not sure if that can happen. Oh, the other thing is uh, just for people to know that there has been a law to ban lynching at the federal level that had been voted on, but one person held it up. And I will not mention his name, but he comes from the state that, as I found out, had uh, been one of 13 that had the worst record for lynching. So uh, it should just be passed. Who wants to have that kind of horror in our midst for all time? Um, so yeah, um, so we went ahead and put a live link to um, the exhibit in the chat um, for people to check out for themselves, what's on view, what's coming up. Um, and, and I know in our conversation, you mentioned there was a write-up in the New York Times about this project. You want to talk a little bit about that before we move on? Okay. Um, it was really a, a big nod uh, to the show and an extra special nod to Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, who put together 
all seven of these shows in a pretty um, record amount of time. And what the article talks about are the shows that started from the beginning up to the point the article was written. So the one that I am in is coming after this article, but there was a mention of that particular show. So I was very glad to know that it was mentioned and that I have some association with it. Also, there are three other artists from Philadelphia who were selected for racism in the face of hate we reduced. Uh, Christina Johnson, Gloria Davis, who's also a doll maker of great renown, and Michelle Flamer, who has been doing some of the Zoom sessions with various artists in, re, um, in conjunction with the Textile Center. And there's one coming up on the 24th you might want to tune into with uh, artist Sylvia Hernandez. Okay, thank you for um, clarifying the, um, the backstory on the New York Times piece, congratulations. Um, and um, if we can get our hands on that information regarding the upcoming Zoom session, we'll, we'll find it and put it in the chat as well. All right, so next up on the agenda to respond to this question about guiding viewers into uh, visions of a just and inclusive world. Uh, Dingley, you're up to talk about the quilt on screen. Two thirds of the 774 million illiterate people in the world are female. Each one will teach two. Okay. Um, in 20, no, in 2000, I dragged my mother to um, the Empire State Quilters Guild in New York. They had a conference and my mother went into uh, the show. I went to the first vendor who had machined and I got Bernie. Bernie is short for Bernina. And I bought my first embroidery machine because I realized that um, I wanted people to be more specific or to actually share the vision that I was sharing or that I saw. And one way to do that is the use of words. And Bernie provided me that tool. Um, this quilt was done for the human rights book uh, by Dr. Carolyn Mazumi, Mazlumi. And I took, um, yeah, here we go. Visioning human rights in the new millennium. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to go back now. <laughs> go ahead. And me being what I call a woman is, I chose this one um, because every human being is entitled to an education. And when I found out that all of these women were illiterate, it just inspired me to make a quilt about it. So at the top of the quilt, you have women who are graduating. In the middle two strips, you have women who are of all colors of the world. And you can't see that, but there's type in here. And it's each one teach two, because um, uh, there's a slogan in the community about each one teach one, meaning that if you have knowledge, then you need to pass it on to one more person. But I felt that as a woman, uh, a lot of us are mothers, and if we're not mothers, we're nurturers. And we have the power, and usually do, share our experiences with one, two, or maybe many, many more people. And then on the bottom here, you have women who have graduated again. So it's as though uh, the women who are in the, the middle two section, these are women who are... Um, they're sort of like at a pause mm -hmm. and they decide to get educated. And then once they do get educated, they pass it on to their children, to other women. So that was my um, thought behind there. And the using of actual text. So there's really no way that people can say, oh, what is this quote about? Um, um, well, they'll make their own interpretation, but and which is fine, but at least they have very concretely in black and white or purple or green, and in the type that I use, exactly what I had in mind. 
So sometimes I will use the embroidered text. Sometimes I'll use alphabet beads mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll use paper, anything that'll produce text so that I can be specific about what it is I'm thinking about or what I'm trying to, the story that I'm trying to tell. Thank you for sharing that. And what struck me was not just the color, but also the use of words and text to convey a message. Um, and I just, like, I really, I don't know, just drawn to the way that you construct faces. And I remember um, you did a couple of workshops recently with Bob, you know, sponsored by Bob Magazine. And you talked about faces. And I remember as I was looking at this quilt, how the faces and the eyes in particular draw you in. Is that something else that's intentional for you in terms of drawing people in to your work? Not really. It's okay. just that I paint people. And also, uh, like when I learn a new technique, the way that I figure out how or the possibilities of that technique is to start with a face. Mm -hmm. And then between the face and the background, I can play with whatever new technique I'm learning. Um, some, at one point, I was in a Eurocentric or I was in a class with a whole lot of white people and they couldn't understand why I kept making these faces. They also could not understand that for me, the face was actually the eyes are the window to the soul. And... That's just my point of reference. That's my own personal point of reference, so. Well, I can tell you that's how, I mean, it works so effectively that the eyes draw me in. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if the chat can maybe speak to that as well. Um, they're just, it's, it's like a magnetic quality to the way you render eyes in your work. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for giving us the backstory on this. And, I'll jump ahead one more time to the <laughs> to the catalog, um, visioning human rights in the new millennium. Um, just to shout out Dr. Carolyn Aslumi again. Um, so I think you can find us on Amazon, by the way. You can. You can. Yeah. So okay. So we're gonna move on. Um, Beth, you're up to address this question. And I have on screen, Wish Fulfilling Justice. If you could talk a little bit about how you use different elements to draw people into your vision for a just and inclusive world. So this piece tells the story of a young woman, Janice Bartley, who I've known for almost 30 years. And um, it is also the one behind me, by the way. Um, okay. And it is also the cover of a book um, that tells not only Janice's story, but also for other people who are living in their own places uh, instead of more traditional congregate settings. And so, you know, I think one thing that the three of us have in common is using this art form to tell stories, both the dark side of uh, a story and also the possibility within that story. And so as many people, for example, may or may not know that as recently as 40 years ago, 5,000 people with developmental disabilities lived in Willowbrook State School. It was an institution. And um, even though the majority of those folks have moved into the community, even still people are at risk of living in institutional settings um, and not really having a life of their own. And when we listen to so many people talk about their hopes for themselves and a better world, there's such a desire for people to have their own space and to be more in control of their own life. And so we wanted to lift up Janice's story and some other folks by um, making it by making visible the fact that people don't make it on their own, that um, Janice becoming her uh, best self is a part of being in a mutual network with 25 other people. And in this case, they're all women, which is actually for the most part true for Janice still. Um, and the idea is that uh, becoming um, 
uh, the whole image is designed to counter this individualistic uh, narrative of merit and achievement. In other words, that we make it on our own and merit is the result of, you know, it's that bootstrapping thing. And it's like, well, no, there is a completely different way to think about achievement and merit through interdependence and mutuality and that Janice's life and the lives of other people who are living in their own places and um, are examples of that. And if we, if we, if we work from the assumption that mutuality, this is where beloved community comes in, that beloved community is not some flawless place. It's a place where people are just grappling with the ordinary challenges that people face, but they're in it together and they're in it together to bring out the best of each other um, uh, in a mutual journey. And so the other point I wanna make about this is that the agency, this is also a large traditional agency that supports Janice and these five other people because of telling their stories and doing it in a way that draws people in. Now that organization supports a hundred people in their own places. And another organization like this more traditional one up in Buffalo supports 2000 people to be in their own places. And so we know we're, we're, um, we're moving towards an understanding of what is actually needed to support people, not just to live independently, but to live interdependently uh, as a result of the experience of beloved community. And so the last slide, if you want to just um, visit Janice and her family. So this was recently Janice turned 50. No one can believe it. Those of us who've known her for a long time. She, by the way, she's been featured in the Moth uh, Story Hour in uh, public radio talking about sex, which is another way to debunk the myths of <laughs> people with um with uh, disabilities. And uh, she's also become a keynote speaker and um, is paid a really good money to share her story and travel uh, all over the United States. But this is Janice and her family and, um, and the 25 people in the overall composite of her support network include her family, but also include anchors, allies, assistants, people in the associations that Janice is a part of, you know, and, and that it's a, it's a big network of people engaged and involved and committed to each other. So I know there's one more slide with, uh, it's a, uh, actually, no, this is it. But I had in my notes that she actually acknowledged the quilt in, um, on her website. Um, so that was probably a, Huge shout out for you. Um, you know, I did a little research on on Miss Bartley and, and found out some really remarkable stuff, including the fact that she um, is a um, highly regarded keynote speaker, etc., um, activist, public uh, speaker, self advocate, um, and has accomplished quite a bit. So, you know, thank you for sharing the story. I want to. Before we move on and open up the uh, conversation to questions from the audience, um, and we may have talked about this in part one, but just to go back to this idea of scale, because I remember encountering your work for the first time, Beth, and thinking, "Holy crap!" This, <laughs> and I'm a I'm a tall person. I'm five ten, and you walk into a room, and and your quilt just draws you in. And just the, the scale of it uh, for me was, was a, a way to draw me into your vision. Um, so if you could just real quick talk about scale as a, as a way to draw people in, the scale of your work. Well, I, I guess when all said and done, I think of it as amplification, right? That if in fact the work is the result of wanting to make visible stories and possibilities that would otherwise be unseen, then to me, part of working at a really large scale is to 
make the story literally big, right? Like this is a big story. And if we let it be as big as it might be, as it should be, and as the people are in their own um, in their own essence, in their own dignity, in their own kind of remarkable uh, uh, presence in society, then, then that in itself changes the way people see and experience um, each other. And so, yeah, the size is an important part of the process of amplification, of making more visible the stories that would be invisible. Thank you for that. And, and I love the use of the word amplification. And I think in the time that we live in right now, when we can use as many tools at our, as our, at our disposal to amplify stories of, of those who have been in the past rendered invisible, making them visible, empowering them through symbol, through color, through technique, through process, you know, through, you know, art making, um, it just makes the conversation about some really tough issues much easier um, to have. Um, so I want to thank the three of you for giving us, you know, giving us a little bit more of a backstory into some selected works. And now we're going to open up um, questions. We'll open up uh, the discussion to questions from the audience. I can't see the chat. So I am going to rely on my colleagues at Networks to Help me help us feel our way through here. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience that um, that came up in the chat? Jessica, this is Shauna, and um, so far in the chat, there's been many, you know, glowing remarks and comments. Um, some have shared their experiences of meeting the artists. Um, so we do have some time for questions. Okay. Love to hear them. It's really great comments. These comments are amazing. Um, if you have a chance um, to peek at the chat, I, I strongly suggest taking a look. Um, Kathy says, I met Beth when she first came to Philadelphia in the late eighties and early nineties. And she shared her talents and gifts working with people with intellectual disabilities in her community. Also, thanks to Networks, I'm pleased to meet Betty and Dinga and their work through these sessions. Um, let's see. I know there was some uh, comments. Gabrielle Patterson says, I think I first met Betty at a show at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Later on, she invited me to be an intergenerational art show to be in an intergenerational art show with Dinga and several other Black women artists. Um, Josh Wapera. <laughs> Woo, go Betty. So glad to have met you at Rush Arts a few years ago. Um, so I'll break there and talk about, Betty, you wanna talk a little bit, a bit about your Rush Arts experience with Josh? Well, um, he probably came when I was not there. Okay. The opening night, I pretty much, uh, remember. And what you need to understand is that Dinga was the person who created that exhibition and she asked me to assist her okay. in curating. All right. So I was um, really glad to be able to suggest some of the younger women that I knew that uh, I thought would really benefit from such a platform. And that show was one that was needed because she and I, Dig and I had had ageism discussions uh, before. Mm -hmm. And so what she did was she wanted to have seven women who were under 40 and seven women who were over 65. And I felt that it was a really great um, coming together because a lot of these women I'm still in contact with. Uh, Gabrielle Patterson, um, you know, Sinai, who's a photographer. And whenever I would come across information, cause I'm signed up with everything and everybody to get information. If I can't use it, I pass it on. And those are the people I pass it on to because I saw that as a continuation of the exhibitions purpose 
which was something dear to my heart even before that exhibition, which was to be in communication with younger artists to give them the benefit of whatever uh, soft or hard knocks you might have gone through because they can give me the benefit of technological knowledge and expertise. And I do call on them because my nickname is Technological Amoeba who will one day develop a nucleus that will divide. So I'm on the back end of all of that in a constant catch up mode. And uh, there's a give and take that can happen between the generations. And for those that don't know that, you know, they need to pick up on it because they have something that we um, can have knowledge of by way of their expertise. And we've been on the chronological road of life to have experienced some things that they still may not have come upon yet that they could get invite advice from us. That's great. Um, so we do have a couple questions. The first one um, from Carol Lyle Shaw is the following. How do you maintain your optimism in the current client climate of the United States of America? Whoever wants to jump in, go for it. I'll tell you how I do it. Um, I look back and my one of my favorite sayings is, if we survive slavery, we can survive anything. Um, I was in Ghana where I actually went to some of the old slave quarters and I was horrified. And I said, this is, my background, these are where my ancestors came from. They survived this. Those who survived um, that strength, however they made it to America, however they kept alive, however they kept whatever traditions they were allowed to keep going. I use that as a point of inspiration. Um, the things that are happening now in the world, they're not new. These are things, a lot of them have been going on since we got here, but they are not always put in the forefront. Like you don't see them on the TV, but this is nothing new. This is the same old mess over and over and over again. And also my other personal thing is try and always be optimistic because the worst has already happened. Um, and you have to give energy to positivity because we're surrounded sometimes with too much negativity, negativity. So why deal with that? I mean, mentally, you got to stay positive in order to keep yourself sane, in order to have a reason to get up the next day, to keep trying to move a little bit forward. Whatever happened in the past has happened already. I'm concerned about making a better day for myself and when I can for the rest of the world so that we can go forward in this life. Yeah, yeah I, wrote I, down, I wrote down resilience mm -hmm. as sort of a companion to optimism. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Your story about visiting Ghana and the slave holding, you know, just the atrocity of that. Yes, Betty. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that this particular time, and I'm going to do it as quickly as I can, okay. has been interesting in that I had to find new ways to do things that I had been doing differently. And one of the things that kept me going, uh, aside from Instagram, because I developed insomnia as a result of a lot of this, the political scene, plus COVID and that kind of thing. I used those hours when I couldn't sleep to communicate with people that I knew in South Africa where it was daylight. So I was able to strengthen friendships in that way. And I was able to discover and communicate with other artists whose work I admired from afar, but now, you know, I'll send them things and, and they, may send things and I like everybody's everything on Instagram. So I had used Instagram basically as a way to almost go back to school again, willingly, 
uh, with things I was interested in, all the Zooms and webinars and seminars. The other thing was self-care, developing a different regimen of self-care in order to deal with what is going on. And music has always been a great equalizer for me. And what this period of time did as a result of Zoom and other platforms was let me go around the world, seeing live music, seeing all kinds of cultural things, visiting other places, because this was the year I had planned to be able to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I have been doing it virtually, because as I said earlier, um, anyone that knows Philadelphia know that Camden, New Jersey is right across the bridge. And I said, I've been in so long and away from things so long, I felt that Camden was even an exotic destination. So being able to communicate with people that are so far away that you don't have the chance and um, learning more, learning a lot more by way of these various platforms. Thank you. Um, Beth, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think the, the only thing that I would add is the actual act of making, especially using our hands, is, um, is nourishing, right? So that in the face of I, I, all the injustice that we all deal with, I mean, we deal with uh, structural racism, structural devaluation, structural things that just seem to take forever to change, um, that, the, that the making of the making of something is one way to just feel like you're still getting somewhere and and also the using of our hands right the being remind being reminded that we are here to be makers we are agents and instruments of possibility and change and that for me personally it's a mindfulness it's part of a mindfulness practice that just pulling that thread, you know, doing that embroidery, sitting at that machine, being in that hum, that rhythm, right, of the, of the needle hitting the fabric. I mean, it's very comforting. <laughs> it's just so uh, for me, the act of creation is a part of what keeps, uh, keeps us going against all odds. So we have another question in the chat from Elena. She says, we've had an avalanche of new media and new ways of communication. That kind of speaks to what Betty was talking about, just broadly, the group, um, about advancing justice in the last several years as artists who have been working in your mediums for decades. Is there anything you'd mention about how your work has evolved over the last well, over in the last de decade or so? So let me repeat that. Is there anything you'd mention about how your work has evolved in the last decade or so. I also say for myself, um, some of the evolution in my work had come with learning some new processes, especially handmade felt in the wet process, not uh, the needle process, which one of those is behind me and um, the fact that I could create an original textile from sheep's wool, it's already dyed, I'm not dyeing the wool, but from the actual wool and through manipulation of and heat and pressure and other kinds of um, things that you must do to create felt, have an original textile, because that had always been something that I wanted to be sure of, is that whatever I created was highly original. So I said, okay, well, with um, thought making, I can create a textile that is original from start to finish. Thank you to all the sheep breeds. Oh my goodness. Anyone else want to speak to how your work has evolved? Um, over the last decade. So, oh. so that's a span of time, a decade. 
Well, one thing that I, I would just add that I think is interesting, first of all, the young people are crushing it, right? I mean, there's such an up, uh, there's just so much amazing art making happening. And that technology has really helped people see each other, learn from each other, see each other. I mean, one of the things that's so interesting during COVID is just all the opportunities like this, right? To, to uh, if you go to an exhibit in a museum, you don't necessarily get to hear people talking about their work and you might admire the work uh, in a different way. But I think there's something for those of us who are devoted to amplification, narration, you know, that's the other uh, term for story quilts is they're narrative quilts. So let's up the game around narrating the quilts. And in the old days, you, you know, you needed a filmmaker and you need it, but now, you know, you can put your phone on and narrate something, right. you know? That's right. And reach millions of people. Yeah. You know, if something goes viral, it changes everything. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Dinga, did you want to respond to that question? Yeah, the only thing I could say is that I have been in a continual state of evolution since I started. So the last decade is just one more 10 years where I continue to evolve, to experiment, to try new stuff, to switch mediums when I felt that I wanted to do that. So. Okay. There's a really comment, a lovely comment, such powerful words, Daniel and Betty. I'm uplifted by your resilience, is that word again, and your intentional cultivation of joy and self-care. Oh, and yes, Beth, the healing, presencing power of making with our hands. Um, such wonderful comments. We're waiting for one more member to um, join she has a question that she wants to pose to you all before we wrap up. Is there anything that you want to share while we wait? Um, Betty, you talked about the piece behind you. Um, and, and Beth, you walked us through um, the piece behind you. Dinga, did you want to share anything about um, what's behind you before Rosa comes on? Let's see if um, I was saying how my use of words and text in this piece, which is not finished, is just the top. Can you see that? Yes. I'll read it to you. It says, don't call me girl. My mother was a maid. Don't call me girl. My grandmother was a maid. Don't call me girl. My mother's mother was a slave. So this is another way that I'm using text and I'm kind of protesting because I, I guess it's my own personal thing. Uh, when people call you girl and I'm not a girl, I remember fighting so hard to be 18 and all the joy and the freedom that I grabbed after I hit 18. So I don't appreciate being called a girl. I know that people say it's just a word, but words have meaning. Sometimes the meanings are overt and sometimes they're under here. So that's what I'm sharing today. Love that. So when, I know I asked you this question, when do you know when one of your pieces is finished? And I told you the last time, usually it's the day before or the night before it's supposed right. to be somewhere. Um, currently, I don't have as many shows, so everything that I'm working on is not finished. However, uh, I'm having a one-woman show in September, and I'm beginning to realize that I've got to start finishing things, so I'm trying to do that. All right. <laughs> Where's it going to be? Um, it's going to be at the Friedman Gallery in New York, F-R-I-D-M-A-N Gallery dot com in New York at some point in September. We haven't set the date, but it's going to be a show of a lot of my media quilts, paintings, drawings, printmaking, and I'm working on a new fabric sculpture. 
it's exciting. And it's the first one woman show that I've had in probably 10 years and maybe the fifth in my lifetime. So I'm really looking forward to it, but the amount of work is kind of overwhelming. So I'm taking it day by day. That's why I have 10 pieces that are nowhere near finished, but you can bet by September 1st, it'll be finished. And I'm putting in the chat your handles on I, on Instagram um, so people can follow along and keep up with what you all are doing, working on, talking about. Um, Ms. Betty, you love DMing me with all kinds of great content. And I'm just wondering, when are you going to put that on your page? <laughs> it's funny. I had to turn my uh, Instagram account to private because it got hacked. Yeah. And I was really nervous um, about how I was going to put work up and what work I was going to put up. Yes. So, um, you know, you can make a request, but just understand, I really am not trying to get a lot of people in there until I have everything set up the way that I want to. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things where the relationship with a younger artist will come in because the advice for um, how it should be set up, what I should put in, what I shouldn't put in okay. you know, will be a factor. That makes sense. I respect that. Um, Rosa, if you can hear me, um, I can. can you go ahead and share your question with our esteemed panel before we wrap I up? Will. Thanks, Tishka, and oh my gosh, Inga, Betty, Beth, thank you ever so much. This is incredible. I, I don't know how you did better this time than last time, because last time was so amazing. But anyway, um, so much of your work is just so personal and poignant and powerful and more. I'm just wondering, and maybe you answered this partly through Carol's question previously, but are there any issues or topics that you haven't yet touched on through your art that you just haven't found a way to do it yet because it's just too emotional or too something or something that's still on the burner for you? Um, I have one project is about black women and lynching because throughout the history of lynching, usually you see men, but there've been way too many black women who have been lynched. I started um, using clay to depict this, but it is a really hard subject. So I've kind of put it to the back burner. I think ultimately it's gonna end up being uh, a textile piece, but some subjects are so personal and so hurtful that it takes a minute mm -hmm. or maybe longer than a minute to get yourself together enough so that you can deal with the subject. Because every time I approach that project, I'm gonna remember all of those women who are no longer here because they died through lynching. And um, artists are very sensitive emotionally, most of us. And so that's a subject that really hurts, but I know it's a subject that needs to be discussed. So at some point I will transfer the clay images onto cloth and that's how I'll kind of resolve it. Anyone else wanna respond to Rose's question? Yeah, um, one of the subjects I was interested in entertaining, I just wasn't sure what aspect of it um, I wanted to approach. It was actually two things, one, sex, but not in the usual way, you know, in, in a more uh, conceptual way and in a way that people might um, have to think because it's not just a bunch of body parts or things like that. And the other thing going to the other end of the spectrum would be um, embracing more diaspora influences that I have had from other cultures who have textile traditions, who are African descended people. Thank you for that. And uh, Beth, you have the last word before we wrap up. Well, I, I would just say uh, that this is not, that it's necessarily so hard. It's just 
finding the time and space, but I really am interested in making a whole series that just lifts up women in our work uh, and the mentors, people, including the two of you. I mean, that it, it, here we are 2021 in, for example, in the field of disabilities, the majority of people who are still the figureheads of our field are men. Uh, white men, okay, no surprise. So underneath all this other stuff, there's still the gender issue and the amazing roles and ways that women have really changed the pattern that continues to be unseen in a lot of ways. And um, it's invisible. Uh, and um, so anyway, that's a long-term project and uh, and Dinga and Betty will be, are, are there uh, in, that imagination. Thank you so much. We did it. <laughs> we did it. We got through the whole thing. <laughs> I want to thank you all so much for sharing, being so generous with your time, your insights, your wisdom. Um, and I think with that, I want to turn it over to our host. Thank you so much, everyone. This is Shauna Roman with Networks. I've been staying in the background. Just want to thank you for um, being a part of this special part two event. Uh, Beth, Dinga, and Betty, we can't thank you enough. Uh, we will, as we did with part one, make uh, the recording available and we'll uh, be sure to alert you when that is captioned and finalized. Um, so again, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending. Yes, thank yeah. you. So great to be with you all. Wonderful. And Kishka, as usual, you knocked it out of the park. The Networks team would like to thank you for attending this session. We hope you've enjoyed it.